Hey everyone, Isaac here. Really excited to share with you our interview with Dr. Cassandra Good about her book, Founding Friendships. But in the interim, since we have recorded that episode, she's actually published a second book that she's been working on for more than a decade. It's called First Family, and we actually got her back into the studio to talk about that new book. That additional interview is tacked onto the end of this one, so make sure you stick around to listen to that. Listen up. I don't know why people are still debating that men and women can't be friends. It certainly wasn't a debate during the founding era. Sure, things were different, but so were the 80s, except for the big hair. Today, we'll be talking about those differences and what friendships were like in the 1700s with Dr. Cassandra Good. This is Too Complicated for History. Today's guest is Dr. Cassandra Good, Assistant Professor of History at Marymount University and author of Founding Friendships, Friendships Between Men and Women in the Early American Republic. Thanks for being here with us today, Cassandra. Thanks for having me. So our first question today that that I think I'm interested in, and Isaac may have the same question, is how did you get interested in the topic of mixed sex friendships in the early American Republic? Because I think today that platonic friendships are very common. um, And I personally wouldn't think they would be as common early on in the 18th century. How about you, Isaac? We we, we can get into it a little bit later, but you'd be surprised at how many men today say that men and women can't be friends. So That's interesting. Yeah, it's still a thing. Um, yeah, but and yeah. I think that I think that's part of where this was coming from. I had seen when Harry met Sally, and I had male friends, and this was in college actually that I started thinking about this topic. And it, you know, it was complicated sometimes, even you know, in college, having friends of the opposite sex. And you know, I think that's kind of strange now that that would be an issue, be, in part because when you think about that, also assumes that the man and woman are both heterosexual. So if you're saying men and women can't be friends, that is assuming they're both heterosexual and also that they're automatically attracted to each other, which I think is also just a false assumption. But I, you know, had been experiencing this in my own life. And then I was doing research for my senior thesis project and came across this letter that this woman in D.C. named Margaret Bayard Smith, who was a very well-connected person in D.C. society, this letter that Margaret Bayard Smith had written to her sister about having said goodbye to Thomas Jefferson uh, on his last day in the presidency. So this is James Madison's inauguration day in 1809. And she talks about how she says to her sister, you know, I I can hardly write this because I'm crying writing this because I've had to say goodbye to Jefferson. And she says, when I got to the president's house, you know, I saw him across the room and then we stood and held hands for a little while. And, you know, she was really, really upset about having to say goodbye to him, even though Mm -hmm. he's moving to Charlottesville, not that far from DC now, (laughs) but she doesn't know if she's ever going to see him again. And she's not just friends with him. She really respects him a lot and admires him. And I saw this and I went to my advisor and I said, I think they were having an affair. Like, I think I discovered right. an affair with Thomas huh. Jefferson. And, and this was from a published <laughs> source from the early 20th. You know, this had been published in the early 20th century. It was not some hidden right, right. source. And she said, well, keep in mind that people talked about their emotions differently then. You can't make that assumption that that's what's going on here. Mm-hmm. And I thought, so they could have actually been friends? What? <laughs> and I started keeping an eye out for this and kept seeing lots of examples of this because I was doing research on the first 30 years of society in Washington, D.C., and I was seeing a lot of friendships like this. And so before I even started my graduate program, I knew this was going to be my dissertation topic. I would ask people, you know, have you seen examples of this? Have you seen collections of letters? And they'd say, no, I've never seen that. But then, I would find it everywhere. 
So Mm -hmm. it's one of those things where I think in part because of our present day assumptions that this is not possible, then we haven't even thought to look for it before. Is it possible that it's worse now? I don't think it's actually worse Hmm. now. I, I do think it's better in the sense that there was a risk for women, especially in these friendships, that if people thought that there was something physical going on in that relationship, it could damage the reputation. A woman with a damaged reputation won't be able to get married. Or if she is married, uh, right, you know, it could be grounds right. for a divorce. Right. Uh, so there's a lot more risk for women involved there. The consequences, the stakes were very high on that front. Right. The stakes are much higher. And I think the whole dynamic of the fact that there are people with multiple gender and sexual identities now also changes the whole equation in ways that people kind of ignore. Yeah, there's this actually, I, I think... I came across this on Twitter that I'd never heard about this. I'm not sure if if either of you are familiar, but the, there's a, a concept called like a Boston marriage. Yes, a same sex couple. Yeah, this is actually that was probably in the recent Vox article on how expensive it is to be single because another friend mentioned this right. to me. You heard of this? I saw it in this article, and actually Rachel Hope Cleve's work on this is really interesting because she has a book called Charity and Sylvia about two women in New England in the early 19th century who are Living, I mean, one of them basically plays the husband role and does the public facing stuff and the financial stuff, and the other plays the female role. Of course, they can't be married, but right. and there is no expression of the identity of being gay or a lesbian at that time. Mm-hmm. There, it was considered that's a behavior. And in fact, from what I have seen, especially younger people before they got married, that kind of, you know, physical intimacy with the same sex, as long as you went ahead and got married, it seems like people were looking the other way. Hmm. And I, I think it was probably fairly common. Yeah. And for just to, to clarify for the listeners, like a Boston marriage is when two people of the same sex would be domestic partners, basically. Right. Um, and, 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 and because it was considered, especially women, I think, specifically, like women living alone in their adult lives was not considered a a good idea. Right. So they say, yeah, it was often encouraged to have another woman live with you. (laughs) Yeah. And so we shouldn't assume that these are sexual relationships. And there's been debate among people who study friendship about the degree to which there is sexual or physical intimacy going on when we see these same-sex relationships, especially people that live together. You see people, there's a book called The Friend by Alan Bray, where he's looking at these friendships in England I think in the 17th and mostly 17th century, and he sees gravestones that have both people's names on them. Um, You know, does that mean that there's a deeper partnership here? And, And even when I say a deeper partnership, does having a sexual or physical relationship make a partnership deeper? I'm not entirely convinced of that, actually. One more sort of prodding question. So as you were doing this (laughs) in your college days, you're thinking about all this. Did any of exposure to these letters or things to at least give you new perspective on your relationships with men that you had, like your friendships? Were, were, like, were you thinking about what those, the nature of them while you were researching? I absolutely was, especially when I was seeing the ways that people were trying to broadcast to people around them. This is just, putting that in quotes, just a friendship, that there's nothing else going on here. Because I was seeing myself having to do that when you know, my, one of my very closest friends in college was a guy and people were constantly saying, oh, why aren't you guys dating? And I was saying, we're friends. That's, that's a thing. That's possible. And, you know, it just sometimes felt like there, we have the term platonic friendship now. They didn't in early America. Really? And I can explain a little bit more about why. But even though we have that term, I don't think that we really have good emotional language for it. I don't think we have great emotional language for what I would refer to as friend love in general. We have romantic love, we have family love, but seeing love between friends, it's not something modeled for us in our culture. And even, you know, part of what I was looking at is reading, trying to get a sense of what the cultural models were in early America, which is mostly British novels, some American novels, And it's always, just like if you think about movies, now, if there's a friendship between men and women, a man and a woman, it almost always ends up in a romance. Yep. That's the, or in the novels back then, sometimes it ended up in the woman being seduced and dying. Uh, So, (laughs) 
it was either that or romance, um, or they have to stop being friends. The only two options. Right. Truly. Yeah. I mean, if you think about, think about even the novel Emma by Jane Austen, which was the first Austen novel published in America. And so this would have actually been available to people in early America. Justice John Marshall really liked this book actually. And there's various friendships between the protagonist, Emma, and men, none of which either continue as a, none of which stay friendships. Like one of them, Mr. Elton, she thinks she's friends with him. He thinks that she's flirting with him and that's a disaster. And then she's friends with Frank Churchill, but that also is messy. And then she's friends with Mr. Knightley, who she ends up falling in love with and marrying. So you can sort of see it just in the course of those friendships. It's a really interesting topic that you're talking about because for me personally, because outside of my freshman year, I uh, all throughout my the rest of the three years of college, I lived with women who I was not romantically involved with, mm-hmm. right. and they did not end in a ro- in a relationship or death. We we're both still kicking. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. What's up, Nora? Um, <laughs> Going to see her next week because she'll be in town. We're still very good friends. Well, um, and, so it and is this possible. Is- It's interesting that your college allowed that because my university did not allow mixed sex living in the dorms, but I knew same sex couples who lived together in the dorms. So, you know, it was a weird, they've since changed that rule, but it was a weird dynamic there that again, ignores sexuality. This was off campus housing. Ah, So like it wasn't part, it wasn't in the university itself. Uh, Yeah. New York, New York is very expensive. Yes. So shoving as many people in an apartment is actually cheaper than living in the dorms if you're going to school there. Weird right. Enough. It's it's interesting that I don't think I've ever had a female friend of mine say that it's not possible for men and women to be friends, but it's always my male friend or male friend, male people I think I'm friends with who say, I don't think men and women could be friends. It's interesting that it's the men who are thinking this and not the women, which I guess shows different perspectives. And um, sort of along those lines, I remember in grad school um, also learning about this language. And I think it was Hamilton writing about, I think it was John Andre, using this very like color, this language is just very emotional and very flowery. And you're just thinking, did he have a crush on this guy? Um, But it was just sort of normal. It's even the men, they were able to use this language and it was, it was okay to call another man, you know, these flowery, this, you know, these things and not, you know, and not worry about being accused, I guess, of, you know, having a crush on an individual. And that's, what's really tricky when you look back at the letters from this time is trying to figure out the emotional vocabulary and what kind of words do they use to talk about friendship or to their friends What kind of words do they use just with, you know, a business partner, acquaintance, and what are they using in a romantic relationship? And initially when I was transcribing letters, I was not transcribing at the beginning, the like dear so-and-so, and and then the sign off at at the end, yours, Mm -hmm. whatever, your humble obedient servant. And then I started to realize that there was in fact a code in those, that the way that people were addressed in the opening and closing of a letter could signal the level of intimacy and the kind of intimacy oh. in that relationship. And so I started, you know, I had to go back to some things. And luckily, I mean, now I photograph everything and transcribe it at home. But back <laughs> then, I didn't. And, you know, it's one of those things, it's a reminder to transcribe everything, because you never know what sort of messages are embedded in different parts, even the material reality of a text. That's very interesting, given the fact that Thinking about it in terms of you know the way we we communicate today, yeah, I, I'd say that that's mm-hmm. very true. Like I don't know how many you know emails I've started that start with "Hey asshole" to a, a very close friend of mine, <laughs> right? But I would never do that to someone I don't. I'm not close with. So, but it could be easily misconstrued or misunderstood if you didn't understand the sort of the context by which you were sort of able to speak with other people different levels, like different closeness. That's interesting. I, I feel bad for future historians of our time <laughs> period now. Like, I just, yeah. <laughs> well, but you know, and this is, you know, part of doing cultural history. And I mean, to me, I sort of looked at this as ethnography of the past, the way anthropologists look for symbols and patterns in people's language and also in objects. I mean, I was looking at art objects they were exchanging too. And I think somebody now could probably look 
look at patterns. There are always things that shift from that. But, mm-hmm. you know, for instance, back then, a man would not call a female friend by her first name in a letter. Mm. You always, Interesting. it was dear sir, dear madam. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, if it's a family member or um, a spouse, you use the first name. And, you know, so there, there are certain things like that, conventions that you just pick up on when you read enough. Mm-hmm. So I, I think part of the the whole men being reductive generally about relation like intergender relationships. Yes. Um, that, it seems like there's like a devaluation of anything outside of like the sexual sphere or the romantic sphere. Right. Then. But that, you know, it means like, oh, that person can't add anything to my life if we're not, you know, somehow involved romantically. Um, so because to, it seems like, you know, it, it's if a man is saying men and women can't be friends, that to me, that's them saying that they don't believe they can be friends. That's the implication. With a woman. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, how I interpret it. <laughs> to belay that, uh, do you have any examples uh, uh, of, of relationships from your book or, or from the extended where there was substance of value gained, like very much appreciated between the two people uh, uh, that were involved? Absolutely. There's a whole chapter of the book on the benefits people got out of these relationships. And it was interesting because I'll say first, since we associate the term benefits like friends with benefits, um, <laughs> right. with physical intimacy, <laughs> that I do think that for some people that was going on. We don't have record of it usually. And, you know, the question there is what is the line between friends with benefits and the romantic relationship? And part of that, I look to how are people themselves referring to this relationship? And what kind of language are they using to talk about this relationship? So, that became my guide more than is there some sign that there's flirtation or physical intimacy. But other benefits, you know, a lot of these relationships were between an older person and a younger one. It could be an older man or woman, younger man or woman. And there's a mentorship relationship going on there, especially if you think about how often people lost family members, especially parents. Mm -hmm. Uh, You see relationships like that. There's also people who serve as sort of go-betweens in a courtship because men and women who are uh, single are not supposed to be writing to each other without permission. And so occasionally if there's a male-female friendship, you know, there's if there's still permissions involved in this, but if the girl's parents, if the girl didn't want her parents to know she was corresponding with this person, um, there's, you know, she could have a female friend that also knows the guy who's sort yeah, of the you, go-between. You tell your friend that you have a crush on the guy and then she goes <laughs> and tells the guy, but you never actually communicate directly. Find out if she likes me. Yes. Yeah. And there is absolutely a situation <laughs> like that with, in fact, the famous, uh, naval commander, John Rogers, who, um, he's mostly famous for fighting in the Barbary Wars, but oh, okay. he had a female friend of his trying to find out, does she like me? <laughs> and being the go between <laughs> with them, including when he's like out at sea and can only communicate in writing. That's really funny. That's fun. Now, so it, it's like, was courtship more f- my? I mean, I, I know a little bit about this, but not not terribly much. But courtship was more formal, then, right? Like there was sort of like a procedure to it of the you know things you were supposed to be doing. Yeah, and especially for upper class people. And a lot of most of what I'm talking about here applies to upper class or certainly what we today would call middle class, upper middle class people. Um, The sort of rules about gender and sexuality are much different for uh, working people, for, you know, enslaved people, for native people. And those are a little bit harder to get to when it comes to this kind of relationship. So just the sort of disclaimer there, but courtship The key thing is that a man and a woman weren't supposed to be alone together. They needed to be chaperoned in some way. And it's only if they're actually engaged that being alone is considered more acceptable. That's alone riding in a carriage together, alone with the two of them taking a walk. I mean, Margaret Barrett Smith, who I've mentioned before, her her fiance was living in a different city for a little while. She was taking walks with a male friend and this older woman said, you have to stop doing that. It's not appropriate. 
And she wrote her fiance and she's like, why can't I take a walk with a man I'm friends with? It's okay with you, isn't it? What is the problem here? So part of this is just worries about two people being alone, so-called alone together. And then there is still parental approval, even though relationships at this point, we have what we call companion at marriage. You are supposed to be falling in love and finding somebody who is a so-called friend to be married to, but it needs to be somebody that the parents approve of. And the parents ideally are supposed to approve. You see novels where bad things happen when the parents intercede. But on the other hand, there's an expectation that a woman is only going to marry a man who can financially support her and that he shouldn't really even be asking if he cannot financially support her and support her to the standard that she is used to. And that's really, I think, what parents are looking for here. I mean, even today, I guess there there are some unspoken rules. But when you think about any sort of uh, set of rules, especially with young people and romance, um, I'm wondering the difference between, you know, the theory of the rules and the practice. I mean, do you think a lot of people were sneaking around or, you know, was it as well followed as we think? Because I think a lot of people look back you know, at the 18th century and think everyone was prim and proper and followed the rules. And then, you know, today we're just, you know, the complete opposite. So I'm wondering, you know, can right. we relate to people back then? Did they sneak around and not follow rules? Oh, I think absolutely that <laughs> happened. There's just much higher risks there, right? Because if a woman right. gets pregnant or is found to have had any kind of intimacy with a man she's not married to, this is a big, big problem for her. Right. Um, On the other hand, you know, if we think about the majority of people are not upper class white people. And in New England around 1800, the premarital pregnancy rate was something like one in three. One in three people were pregnant already at the point they got married. Um, But they did go ahead and get married. That's the thing. As long as you went ahead and got married. The real issue here is not just morality, but is the community going to have to financially support this child? And that's right. So it's not just a moral policing thing. There's certainly, especially among upper class people, is moral policing. Part of what Americans think makes them different from Europeans is that they are virtuous, and that includes sexual virtue. And so they look at the licentiousness of the nobility in France and England and say, this is not okay. And this is what is destroying their political system. And so I think that's why there's more policing, both of these friendships and of courtship in this period. But that's absolutely the case. I mean, if we just went by what etiquette guides, letter writing manuals, novels suggested about friendships between men and women, all of those say that they were impossible at the time. So, you know, just seeing what people said the rules were is not going to indicate what's actually happening on the ground. So you're absolutely right about that. So my, my favorite, I guess, mentorship relationship from the early time period was, uh, Bushrod Washington and Elizabeth Willing Powell. And he had a huge crush on her. And from my my interpretation, um, she was sort of trying to mentor him and teach him how to speak to speak to a lady, speak to a woman, sort of how to deal with um, uh, romance or wooing uh, a young lady. And I was wondering if do you have any sort of favorite stories or favorite, not only mentorship, but sort of friendships or relationships from your from your book that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, no, I mean, Elizabeth Powell is interesting because she's not just friends with Bushrod Washington, but with George Washington. Right. And there's actually a number of other men that she's friends with too. But actually one of my favorite friendships that I wrote about is between this woman that, you know, I can't imagine anybody has heard of now, um, Eloise Payne. <laughs> Uh, Her brother actually is known as a playwright, uh, John Howard Payne. And I found these letters in his papers, actually. She became friends with the Unitarian minister, William Ellery Channing. And what I really like about that friendship is you see a negotiation there and you see how different this is from a marriage because she can leave at any time. If she doesn't like how he's treating her, you know, she can leave. And she does see him somewhat as a mentor. He's a little bit older and is trying to help her. She needs to support herself financially. He's trying to help her get jobs at various schools. But when she thinks he's lecturing her and not being understanding, she tells him 
and just says, don't talk to me this way. I don't appreciate this. And he writes back chastened. And so you see that the power, the power dynamic there is just different than in other relationships between men and women in this period. Mm. She has more power here. And, you know, partially William Mallory Channing is somebody that was known as uh, having a lot of female friends and being somebody who got along really well with women. How much this is connected to the fact that he was also described as slightly effeminate, you know, I think Jefferson was sometimes too, and he had a lot of female friends. So I think that often men who had a lot of female friends were seen as maybe more sensitive. And, you know, if we think about somebody like Jefferson, soft-spoken and able to engage with women better. But that relationship too, my favorite part is there's a letter that she writes to him, Eloise, to William Ellie Channing. And she... She's either engaged or close to being engaged with this guy and he was leaving and she's writing Channing about it. And she says, I'm crying as I'm writing this. And there is an actual mark from a teardrop still on the letter. You can still tell. And that kind of emotional connection coming through 200 years later is pretty incredible. So sorry for the interruption, but we're going to take a brief break now for a word from our sponsors. That's that's very sweet, but the cynical person in me wants to be like, oh, being dramatic, writing that the tear is hitting and allowing it to hit the page rather than just wiping it off while you're writing it. <laughs> oh, entirely possible. <laughs> yeah. uh, people, but another difference between then and now is that emotion was supposed to be expressed bodily. You were supposed mm. to cry at certain points. And it was thought that men and women both have this capacity. It's not until getting into the antebellum period that people start thinking of women as being inherently more emotional or better able to feel. Especially in the late 18th century, this what we call cultural sensibility, part of demonstrating that you're a genteel thinking person is showing the proper emotional response. And it's not being melodramatic per se, but it is you know, showing those reactions. Although on the other hand, there are cases where it's supposed to be very regulated. So there are times where you were supposed to show emotion and times where you are really not supposed to. So I think that there's more lines around it, but also more space, especially for men to show emotion, both through their writing and physically. Gotcha. I wonder if Heart attack rates were a little bit lower back then. <laughs> keep, it's, keep, it still keep sounds keeping things bottled bottled up. <laughs> it still sounds stressful though, because it seems like if something comes up and you have to first pause and say, "May I feel this emotion? May I show that I feel this emotion?" It just seems very, still very regulated. I don't know if it. I'm curious to 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 know if like if the we if we live by those kinds of rules and don't even realize them. And it's only in hindsight could someone go back and being like, these are the, the, the specific ways that were acceptable to express yourself during, you know, the early 2010s, the 2020s. Um, but yeah, because I think we're the, in it, we can't see the system. Right. right. So there's actually a theoretical term for this from Pierre Bourdieu called habitus. This is getting a little technical, but habitus is the, like, we don't see it because it's like embedded in us, in our bodies, in our brains and the air we breathe. but it is sort of the set of rules and standards of behavior from our society. And it's not just natural, it's constructed by society. And we can't, I mean, the the thing for Bourdieu is you can't really get out of it and see it very easily. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, what you're saying is probably true that we are living by, we, I think that we might have a little bit more latitude than they did. And I think we are monitored less closely in certain ways. I mean, with social media, it's different, but I think if you think about most people are living in communities that they don't leave very much and where everybody knows everybody else and knows everything Mm -hmm. about them. And this is part of why these relationships, these friendships are policed so much because everybody's watching each other in a small community. I mean, there's an example of a woman who is serving as a courtship go-between for a male friend of hers, and he's writing her letters and his seal with his initials is what is closing that letter. There are no envelopes. You just folded up the letter, you mm-hmm. left an address pane, and you used a wax seal and you pressed it in with something with your initials. And she says mm-hmm. to him, can you please stop using your seal because these letters go through a bunch of hands before they get to me and all my neighbors think that there's something going on with us. 
<laughs> and wow. so, cause there's not a mailman coming and delivering it. Right. Right. There would right. be like, this is in the newspaper. These people have letters to come pick up. So, you know, there's not the level of privacy that I think that we enjoy today. That's interesting. I, I can't get over the go-betweens. Like who knew that middle schoolers are still like following this long storied <laughs> tradition that goes back several hundred years. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, you know, we were talking about benefits of these relationships before. It, it's not just, so we talked about, you know, family sort of stand-ins. We talked about the courtship, but there's also people, you know, providing emotional support for one another. You definitely see this in the relationship of Eloise Payne and Willie Mallory Channing. That's, you know, part of why she feels free to cry in a letter to him is that he's providing mm-hmm. her emotional support. And that's not just something, again, that women are doing for men. Men are also doing this for women. And there's also people who are, you know, providing intellectual stimulation for each other. I think with Abigail Adams and Thomas Jefferson, that's a big part of their friendship Right, is they yeah. sort of enjoy that intellectual exchange. And I think in a lot of these friendships, that's the case. So there are other benefits, even, you know, in religious communities, the idea was that you reached God in part through a friendship and God was like the third party in the friendship. And those are probably where you see the most effusive expressions of emotion uh, in those friendships between often like evangelical congregants. And they will talk about, you know, ministers often had many female friends, more women than men were regular church goers. And you see pretty effusive emotional expressions in their letters. Do you think maybe that felt safer because as a I minister, think, they were supposed to be yeah, sort absolutely. of absolutely. <laughs> well, and because... I I argue in the book that you need to have some third party to the relationship and because God is the third party here. So it could be if you're married, your spouse is sort of in on the relationship, could be you're part Mm -hmm. of a larger friend group. In this case, God is sort of the third party that ensures its propriety. Although there is a very interesting example. There are several examples, actually, of ministers having inappropriate relationships with female congregants. And there's this one minister that tries fleeing to the Caribbean for a little while to oh. stave off accusations. And he actually has himself castrated uh, because, he wa- <laughs> yes, because he wants to prove that there can be nothing going on between him and this woman. And after she dies, he actually publishes their correspondence as you know an example of a very pious woman. But yes, that is an extreme example. Yeah. Yes. I mean, to put it lightly. Um, yes. I wish I wish our listeners could see the look on Isaac's face. <laughs> <laughs> but, that. Just to prove, <laughs> you know, he could have just published the letter. I, like, <laughs> also, does that prove anything? I mean, right? It it does seem like a strange. Move. It's a there very are... jump. It's a big jump. <laughs> yeah, I mean, me. <laughs> I think in some ways the most interesting parts for me of this book were the people who are not really following the rules and yeah. end up in strange situations like that. Um, (laughs) or just, you know, have big misunderstandings, um, or, you know, in the case of Daniel Webster, the famous orator of, you know, the antebellum period had this female friend who was an artist. And after his death, they found a small, about two inch by one inch ivory miniature of her breasts. Um, (laughs) and it's called beauty revealed. And the artist is Sarah Goodridge. And the only letters that survived between them are just like, hey, I'm stopping by. Or she was loaning him money at a certain point. Um, it's like the OG sexting. Like I said, the tiny mobile miniature. It is, <laughs> it is, well, and this is a period where people don't display nude art at all. Right. Right? Like the first nude painting in America was shown very soon before she painted this piece. And I actually think if you compare, and I have both these images in my book, if you compare the naked breasts in that painting that was this famous painting and it was on display near where she was living, I I think it may actually be based on that. 
um, Mm, maybe less of a selfie than we think. But there was no sign (laughs) during their lifetimes that this was a sexually intimate relationship. As far as anybody knew, this was a friendship. Right. Hmm. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. I don't know. Just to go back to something you said earlier about the, you know, God being the third party. I don't know if you've ever been to a Catholic school dance, but it reminded me of when you know, the teachers, yeah. the chaperones are always saying, leave room for the Holy Ghost. I <laughs> heard <laughs> this. <laughs> Which is I kind of hilarious <laughs> in that. It sort yes. of makes the Holy Ghost less of a buffer and more of a participant in the dance right now. <laughs> Well, but part of what we have to understand, too, is that in this period for evangelicals, as for like Quakers, too, you weren't supposed to engage each other as people in bodies, but as souls. And so Mm. the body doesn't matter that much. And I mean, this is somewhat true for the Unitarians, too. But this is why in those religious communities, they see it as, you know, the souls are don't have any sex to them. Right, right. That's actually interesting because I, you know, weird anecdote, personal anecdote. So in Pennsylvania, they allow you to have um, basically a Quaker marriage license. Anyone can get one, even if you're not a Quaker. Um, but it doesn't require the signature of a religious authority. Right. right. Like I've that. heard it's of just this. The two, it's just the two people. And it's actually the kind of, uh, that's what I had because we, you know, we didn't want to necessarily have, it's just the two people who are in the marriage, two witnesses, and I guess God. <laughs> there are the people that are involved in the contract. That's interesting. Yeah. I just quick question of, I, I don't know why. So this is just me sort of psychoanalyzing my own reaction to some of this stuff in this conversation in real time. But I keep thinking back to when I was younger. And I guess it's when I had more friendships that were female at the time. Like, I guess it's like that age. Now, did, were children, in, like, was there any like separation of the sexes in for kids at the time? Did that evolve as you got older? Or is it where the kids were yeah. treated all the same? Well, so kids under six or seven are basically treated the same and in fact, dressed the same. If you see these old portraits with children, you can't tell if it's a boy or a girl because they're all wearing right. these sort of, I don't want to say sack-like dresses because they're a little bit nicer than that, but they're sort of right. freeform dresses. And it's a big deal when the boy is breached when he starts to wear breeches, um, mm-hmm. the earlier version of pants. And the mother was taking care of the children when they were younger. Once the boy is starting to wear breeches, he becomes more his father's responsibility. He's probably going to have his own tutor or go to a school at that point. And there is going to be more separation between boys and girls at that stage. Their education starts diverging, their clothes are diverging, gotcha. what's mm-hmm. expected of them is diverging. But certainly, you know, they need young people to meet each other and get married. So there are plenty of mixed sex social spaces for young people. There were some schools that were mixed sex in this period. They weren't all single sex. Hmm. There was a lot of um, great material actually at the archives in Litchfield, Connecticut, where they had both a law school and a female academy. And those schools were right near each other. And so they interacted a lot. Hmm. And so you see a lot of great examples in a setting like that of friendships between men and women. I want to look a little bit now on a bigger scale because what's interesting by your example and what we're speaking about is it seems like in friendships that men and women are pretty equal in these friendships and the power dynamics are different in marriage because the men have more um, power in the marriages at this time. And also then looking at society, it seems like this these this equality that you see in these friendships uh, when you study early America, you don't tend to see that equality between men and women in greater society. Right. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? It's just interesting that they found this equality in friendships that they couldn't find anywhere else, really, at the time. Right. And, you know, if you look at descriptions of what marriage is supposed to be like in this companionate marriage model, it's to friends. And there is sometimes some language about being on equal ground, but it's hard to be on equal ground when as a wife, you lose the right to own any property or speak for yourself in a court. When the husband basically takes all of that, not like he's grasping at it, but it is just given to him. Unless a woman does a marriage settlement before she gets married, a a prenup, she can't own property until Mm -hmm. the 1840s starting you know, and that's only in some states. So 
marriage, we talk about coverture, the idea that man's legal identity covers the woman. So right. for all the language about the fact that marriage is becoming more egalitarian in this period and more like friendship, we can't deny how much power a man has in these relationships. Whereas, and and I think even, you know, you could compare maybe a sibling relationship between a brother and a sister is the closest thing to this. But mm-hmm. There are plenty of cases where a brother is technically the guardian for an unmarried sister. Right. So there can be a power dynamic too. And there's just no power dynamic like that, no legal authority in these friendships. So it's just not going to have, certainly there's no state sanctioned power here. And I don't want to pretend that they're completely equal because they're still living in a world where men have many more rights and where people, on the whole, don't think that men and women should have equal rights, that, you know, the women, you know, even men like Jefferson, who wants to have conversations about politics with Abigail Adams, is horrified in general by the idea of women talking about politics. Mm -hmm. He's okay to do that with Abigail, but, you know, more generally, there are still these views. So it doesn't mean because these are egalitarian relationships that they suddenly changed the world um, and gave women rights. But I do think when you think about how important equality was as a at least stated ideal, even if not much practiced in the founding period, these relationships come closest to that if you're looking at relationships between men and women. And so they're really reflecting the political ideals of the period. That dynamic that you brought up, Lynn, sort of reminds me of or I, I think it kind of gets summed up in, uh, we actually talked before we started recording about the Abigail Adams letter to John Adams talking, you know, don't, or I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but don't forget the ladies or something along those lines. But then his also, I think something that's often forgot is his response to it mm-hmm. kind of get, kind of <laughs> exemplifies that dynamic that it's, you know, he calls her saucy. <laughs> he calls her saucy, but also, um, Lynn, you want to say, I forget, I'm forgetting exactly what it is. It's sort of like, oh, yeah, of course, haha. But, you know, we all know right. who's really in charge. Right, right. He's, he, he essentially writes, well, you know, we're not, because she talks about getting rid of the, you know, these masculine systems and how men would be tyrants if they could. And he essentially says that, well, yes, in in words, we're in charge or, you know, in theory, we're in charge, but we all know who's really running the show, who's here. really running the show. And then my favorite line, you know, of all is he says, if they were to get rid of this masculine power, that they would have to live by the despotism of the petticoat. Right. Which, which is just a fantastic line. Well, I think, and people misunderstand what she's even asking for. I think, right. It, you know, what she's really saying is in terms of men being tyrants, it's that husbands, she wants better legal protections for women in marriages. She's not asking for the vote. And, you know, that, that is something that almost no woman is even mentioning in this period. Cause I have looked very hard for this and you see scattered mentions of women saying, you know, I really should be able to vote. And Abigail does say at some point, she knows in New Jersey that women can vote for a short period. And she basically says like, yeah, if they did that in Massachusetts, I'd want to vote. So that's the closest that I know of that she really comes. But I think the other interesting thing too is that historians have looked back at that and sort of taken John's line. Um, There's a recent book by Gordon Wood where he says, oh, Abigail's just joking there. She doesn't really mean anything by it. And, you know, you go on and see Abigail's angry letter to Mercy Otis Warren saying, how could John say this? (laughs) She's not kidding. Yeah, as if the two of them were never biting in letters to each other. (laughs) Like his response is kind of hurtful. Uh, and, and silly, d- dismissive in a way that is could would definitely be upsetting, right? And I do wonder the degree to which he felt threatened. Although mostly this would have been later, I don't think people realized Abigail's level of intellect in the public sphere yet. But mm-hmm. when he's president, there's a point at which she's out of town, and he makes a decision. And there's somebody who says, "Well, if Abigail had been here, he wouldn't have done that." And we know that like she's actually the one keeping him in line. Right. And, you know, there's somebody else who says, and I think it might actually be Judah Sargent Murray, the early sort of proto-feminist writer from New England, who says, like, if anything happened to the vice president, you know, I'd rather have Abigail step in. <laughs> so 
And she was referred to as Lady President Tess. Oh, wow. You know, she she was recognized as having a lot of influence and not just directly through John, but she had male friends that would go through her to get political influence and power. Yeah, this is just my personal and again, I'm the non-historian of this conversation, uh, personal opinion that she's probably one of the biggest, like, or the most significant intellects in, on, in the country. And like, she's, uh, it can go toe to toe with all of them. Like if any of the, any of the people you would, so like Madison, I think, Jefferson. you know, I think Mercy, Mercy Otis Warren is probably much better read than because yeah. Mercy Otis Warren's family library was so extensive. She was educated with her brother. Her level of knowledge and writing ability is pretty strong. And Judas Sergeant Murray, I would say also, and even a little bit earlier, you know, Eliza Lucas Pinckney had been educated in England. So right. there are people we don't know as much about. I can't believe more people don't know about Mer- Mercy Otis Warren. This is somebody who's really involved in political conversations through, she writes plays during the revolution. She writes an early history of the American revolution that really angers her close friend, John Adams. And John Adams yes. writes a series of very ugly letters to her about how she has misinterpreted him. Um, and I, and that also speaks to the fact people spoke about women at this point as being nonpartisan. And, right. you know, part of the nice thing for men is, oh, if you're friends with a woman, partisanship doesn't come into it. And that's absolutely not true. I mean, right. You see, Mercy Otis Warren stops being friends with both George Washington and John Adams over political differences. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's not like Elizabeth Powell wasn't a very fervent Federalist, <laughs> right? Exactly, right. right. Yeah, that's Women crazy. just weren't seen to have the intellectual capacity to be partisan, or they were they were thought to they just weren't allowed to be in the conversation. How are they even justifying this? I think that the idea was that because women are not in elected office, they can Ah. sort of soften things. And they also, you know, have a softer temperament that, you know, they can sort of step in and converse with men about these things without getting so heated about it. But that's just not really true. So, (laughs) you know, there's plenty of very partisan women at this time. And partisanship you know, especially early decades in Washington, you know, during Jefferson's time with people like Burr around, like partisanship Mm -hmm. is pretty, pretty ugly and cutthroat at this point. Yeah. It it wasn't, it wasn't a nice time to be like, you know, in politics, we weren't very nice to each other. (laughs) Well, part of what was difficult for people is they hadn't separated. There was no separation between your life as a politician and your personal identity. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think this might feel more familiar to us now. If we look, you know, I think people look back at like the 1970s in this country as like, you know, oh, politicians on both sides of the aisle were friends. They hung out together. You know, they didn't see each other just as their political identity. And now that's basically impossible and for different reasons than back then. But politics wasn't a career then you didn't make much money doing this. I I would remind our audience that you're not supposed to now, just FYI, (laughs) for the the people listening. (laughs) It's not supposed to be a a get rich. It's not supposed to be It's not supposed to be a get rich, but people are paid, you know, a living wage uh, or a pretty good wage. Well, they get paid very well, but not yet. Right. It's not enough to become rich. It's they get rich off the lobbying afterwards, which was not an option in the same way back then. But people were paid an extremely small amount and you were only serving, you know, Congress only sat for like four months. So yeah. they're not even in away from home for that long. And I should say most men are not bringing their wives with them to Washington. There's sort of a core of families that live in Washington. And there's a few people, especially like the president, the secretary of state that are really there most of the year will bring their wives. But there's a lot more men than women. And that also creates a space for, I think, more interaction actually between men and women. And a lot of the politics is not going on. They only sit for a few hours a day in Congress. Most Mm -hmm. of the actual politicking is happening over teas and dinners. And women are there Mm -hmm. in all those spaces and talking to their male friends. So I think that we tend to forget too that 
these friendships are just sort of part of everyday life in on the political scene. Yeah, I, I think that just even interpersonal relationships uh, are taken for granted, or at least underplayed in terms of significance in history. Uh, when we were working on the documentary, one of the things that I talked uh, mentioned a couple of times was that you know have and asked several male historians, have you ever made a career decision without consulting your family? Like a major one that was going to you know uproot their lives and change the way it was like without considering your family at all. And that the answer was always no. Uh, and it would be silly for us to think back that those relationships and those, you know, those connections to both your families and your, your, your social circles didn't have an impact on how you proceeded through, you know, the big things, the signing of the treaties, the, the, all those things, but all the little things that lead up to those moments. Well, and we even know that it's sort of the rules change over time in the House and the Senate, but women are allowed on the floor with the members in the chambers at this point. And during the Missouri Compromise debates, it's packed with all the congressmen's friends, female friends. If they were sitting in the gallery, there was like, they would send pulleys with baskets of oranges up to the women. And if somebody was giving a speech, they'd start over if a big group of women came in. It was partially, this was your entertainment if you went to Washington. But if you were friends with a member of Congress in the House or Senate, you could sit on the floor with them as the debates are going on. And I just think it's impossible to imagine that they're not discussing what is happening with them. The problem oh, is, oh yeah, we don't <laughs> just sitting have, there, not doing anything. we don't have a record right. of it. <laughs> we don't know exactly. And so I've had people say, well, how can you prove that women had political influence through these friendships? Show me a piece of legislation. Well, first of all, there's very few pieces of legislation passed in this period. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, Although, you know, you could probably look at some of this sort of patronage type legislation where they're giving somebody a pension and say a woman was behind this. But a lot of this is hidden. And we have to think about other ways to understand power and politics and how all of this works. And it's not just relationships between men and women. It's between men with each other that personal relationships are fundamental to how politics operates. Yeah, you're totally right. And a lot of that is between the lines. It's in the cracks. It's, mm-hmm. it's you know, it's scribbled on a note on the back. Yeah, it's scribbled <laughs> on a note of a back page of a letter about something else. Right. Uh, and then you would never know. Or it's a pair of marble breasts that get mailed to the right. Just to be clear, right, it's you know, painting on ivory. It was not sculpted. Oh, ivory. Yes. Sorry, I, 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 mis, I misheard you. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was a sculpted pair. No, no, not yeah, sculpted. Like, not sculpted. It is, it is a painting. Very, okay. <laughs> you can, if you Google Beauty Revealed Met Museum, it's at the Metropolitan Museum. I don't think, I don't know if it's on display in the American Wing right now or not. It sometimes has been. I have seen it in gotcha. person before. So That makes slightly more sense there. in my head. Yes, there's a lot out there <laughs> right. about this portrait, actually. <laughs> And this is, I mean, this also goes back, we're talking at the very beginning about the term platonic friendship. And I said, I wanted to explain Mm -hmm, why I don't use that. And this relationship might fall into that. Um, Platonic at that point meant romantic, but not consummated. Hmm. It did not mean no sexual attraction. So, you know, it's possible in this Daniel Webster, Sarah Goodridge relationship, I think it's more likely that there's physical intimacy there that it was consummated if she's giving this image to him. But, you know, a, a friendship, so that's why I don't use the term platonic. I use the sort of awkward term mixed sex. Um, there are times that people occasionally use the term platonic, but generally still when they're using that, it's the idea that it's that there's something romantic. Right. Yes, yeah, so they don't even have a word for it. Right. And I I do think that, and again, there's, you know, all sorts of theory on this, that the vocabulary we have can influence the way we understand the world, Mm -hmm. right? That the the words we have to label things, especially when it comes to emotion, there's work on emotion that, you know, there may be a fundamental inner emotion, but how we understand what that is comes through our cultural vocabulary. And so if people are feeling what I would call friend love for a friend of the opposite sex, they don't have any way to think about that or describe it. And I think that that, you know, you often see there's plenty of people writing about being confused about the status of their relationship. They don't know what this is or how to feel 
and how to act. We as humans like to have labels or like to have to understand what things are. Yeah, sort of I, I, do think that the, I do think the lack of label and in fact, all of the published material saying that these are impossible affects people's ability to understand what's going on. On the other hand, the fact that they have these relationships despite that tells us something. It tells us that these relationships are important to them and worth it to them, despite the fact that they're risky and hard to understand. Absolutely. And you really are coming at this like an anthropologist. I know, it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I, I did, I have taken a lot of anthropology and I think a lot about rituals and symbols in my work. And so, right, I, I there are n- multiple people have said, this book is kind of like an ethnography. And I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I was doing. <laughs> And I think actually Joanne Freeman says the same about Affairs of Honor, that she's taking right. an ethnographic approach. And that book was hugely influential on me in terms of thinking about what I was doing here with this project. So historians should read more anthropology. That would be my Yes, they should. My Absolutely. Plea. Yes, they should. And, and for any listeners who want to check out Cassandra's book, uh, it's called Founding Friendships, Friendships Between Men and Women in the Early American Republic. And it does feel different from a lot of other historical books out there about the era for every all the reasons we talked about today absolutely and would you like to uh cassie would you like to plug um what are you working on right now you're working on a book that will hopefully be out in the near future yes so when i was working on this book i came across you mentioned bushrod washington before Mm -hmm. and i thought who is this and then i came across nelly custis and eliza custis and i found out these were all the next generation in George Washington's family. And I thought, well, I have never heard of this person, any of these people. I thought George Washington, you know, I knew he didn't have kids. I didn't know there was any other family. And why don't we know who these people are? And so I started thinking about doing a biography even while I was working on this book. And so my next book coming out, hopefully 2023, will be called First Family, George Washington's Heirs and the Making of America. And it will be all about George Washington's step-grandchildren, Martha's grandchildren from her first marriage, the Custises, who, you know, all the the women in that family did have male friends, uh, but they also centered their lives around being George Washington's descendants and used that as their source of power. So I'm also talking about other forms of political power here too, in this case, through family rather than friendship. I'm I'm very excited about that book. I know a lot of people who um, are very excited to to read your upcoming work, and I think it's going to shed a lot of new light on George Washington. I think a lot of people tend to think there's nothing new, and that we're not going to learn anything new about the era or about the Washingtons. And so, very much looking forward to that. And we hope to have you back on our podcast when that's released. You can tell us all about that and. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very excited for, yes. for that. Book. And um, partly because I think people here in America t- tend to think that inherited power isn't really a thing. Right. That it's a very un-American idea. Uh, but, yeah. And that uh, was one of my questions. How do how does this first first family navigate this question and fear about inherited power? And, you know, part of it is that three of them, three of the four are women. And so that sort of shapes where they can go. And if George Washington's step grandson had been a more competent person, this might have gone <laughs> differently. But um, you know, George Washington actually sort of hints that he had hoped he would serve the nation in some way at some point, but uh, that was not to be, at least not through official channels. Well, don't spoil it. I've got to yes. leave it as a cliffhanger. So we'll buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say the cliffhanger is why do we not know who these people are? Ah, what exactly. happened? To yeah. them? How yeah. did they? Yeah. They were super famous to the point like there was a wax figure of Nellie Custis at a museum at the time. How does nobody know who these people are now? Who, wow. who doesn't want you to know the real truth? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we'll you know, find the, out. There is a new society of descendants of presidents, and you have to be yeah. blood descended. So none of the Custises oh, really? could even <gasps> be part of this. Oh, so wow! Go. That's who. <laughs> oh, it's all a conspiracy. I love right. it. Could, could, if there, any of our listeners want to find you on social, are you active on social media? If they want to like, follow your work, where, where, where could they go look? So my website is Cassandra Good Historian, all one word, dot com. And I'm on Twitter at 
Cass A. Good. So no periods in there or anything, just Cass A. Good. And I tweet pretty much solely about history things. And um, so I'm happy to have people follow me there. Thank you so much for sharing about your fantastic work. And we're definitely looking forward to your future work as well. So we really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Whoa, wait, hold on. Don't stop listening yet. We have some bonus content for you. We welcomed Cassandra Good back into the studio. And we're going to talk a little bit about her brand new book, First Family. Take it away, Isaac. All right. Welcome back, uh, Dr. Cassandra Good. Thank you so much for joining us again at another time and place to talk about your new book, First Family. I'm really excited to be back. So uh, could uh, you tell us a little bit about the inspiration for this book and, or why you decided to uh, write about George Washington's uh, grandkids and family? It actually came out of founding friendships because I came across several of those grandchildren when I was researching that first book. I came across Nellie Custis and uh, I also came across Eliza Custis and some of her friendships. I probably wrote more about than Nellie. And then I also came across Washington's nephew, Bushrod Washington. And looking at those people, I thought, wait, I didn't know George Washington had that there was this next generation of the family. Who are these people? And I started looking for biography and there wasn't one. Hmm. And I thought, I knew I wanted to do a biography for my next project because I got to dive into little bits of different people for founding friendships, but I really wanted to do a deep dive on a smaller number of people. One person would have been a lot easier. As it turns out, writing a group biography is extremely difficult (laughs) because you have to follow a lot of different people. (laughs) But, um, It was really my curiosity from just coming across them in the first book, realizing that nobody had really written about them. And I thought, well, if they were president's children, what happened to them? What did people think of them? Washington was treated almost like a king. So who were they in society? And that's what really brought me to the book. So sorry for the interruption, but we're going to take a brief break now for a word from our sponsors. So along that line of questioning, something really interesting about the book is your description of what family is, because you talk about those Washington descendants, but then you talk about the Custis descendants. So can you talk about how you define family and who exactly this family is that's, you know, covered in your book? Well, this is an interesting question, because when I first decided I was going to write a book on the Washington quote unquote descendants because he didn't have any biological children. Uh, right. So people would say, well, so who, who are you writing about? And I'd say, well, I'm not really sure yet. And so I started looking because I knew he had a bunch of nephews and nieces that he also, some of whom he also helped raise. And so I'm mm-hmm. looking all over in archives to try and find letters And what I find over and over again is that the Washington nieces and nephews didn't leave that many letters. What they did leave suggests that most of them were basically just Northern Virginia planters and slavers, nothing particularly interesting or remarkable about them. And in fact, nothing that publicly, like people don't seem to even be thinking about them as the next generation of the Washington family. Even when Bushrod Washington, the one who inherits Mount Vernon and had been a Supreme Court justice, when he dies, his obituary doesn't mention that he's related to George Washington. That's wild. So, uh, right. And so, you know, then I was also looking at these custises and Rosie Zagari, who you've interviewed on your program, Mm. said, I think your story is about the custises. And I said, I can't Mm -hmm. just write about them. There's all these other people. But I increasingly realized she was right because those are the people who shaped themselves as Washington's family. They were Hmm. the ones that were constantly out there saying, hey, we're George Washington's children. George Washington was our adopted father. We have George Washington's stuff. And (laughs) they also had the closer relationship with him. Bushrod says, like, I I always felt nervous around him. I never really knew him that well. Mm -hmm. These are the people that actually lived in his house, knew him well, knew him at a personal level. And then also got all of his stuff. Bushrod gets an empty Mount Vernon. (laughs) All of George Washington's stuff ends up with the grandchildren. And so for a whole combination of reasons, largely their own choices, they Mm -hmm. become Washington's family, even though they don't have the last name Washington. They are not blood related to George Washington. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows they're not blood related. So to me, that's really interesting in terms of what it says about who counts as family and Mm -hmm. the degree to which we can shape family. That's fascinating because he had a pretty, Washington himself had a pretty 
wide definition of the term family, or at least he considered lots of people to be close to him and are treated as such. Well, and I actually, I wrote a scholarly academic article on Washington's definition of family. Because Mm -hmm. if you look in his papers and because his papers have been digitized, you can do a really easy keyword search and Mm -hmm. look at every different time he uses the word family. And that's what I did. And he uses it differently in different instances. So sometimes by family, he means the military officers surrounding him in the revolution, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes he means... And I'd say most often, all of the white non-servants living in his household. Hmm. Uh, Occasionally, but very rarely, he includes everybody on the plantation. The only time he does that is when he's talking about health and illness, which I think is interesting. And Hmm. if you look, it's the same with James Madison. I looked at the other founders' papers. You don't get people referring to enslaved people as part of the family that much until the 19th century Mm -hmm. when you get into ideas about pro-slavery and paternalism. Hmm. Uh, Then at two different points, George Washington says, I have no family. One in Hmm. a public draft for a speech and another in a letter. And he even says at a certain point, you know, so Nellie... His adopted daughter is marrying his nephew, Lawrence Lewis. And he's saying, I'm glad Mm -hmm. that Nellie is marrying into my family. Interesting. And so when I read these things, I thought, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. And what's really going on here is that there's multiple meanings of the word family. But one of the most important at this time comes from a very British legal definition of blood descent by marriage Hmm. family. Inheritance law is super strict about descent through blood heirs. So Hmm. one of the reasons people are comfortable with Washington becoming president is he doesn't have kids. The fact that he has an adopted son that's his step-grandson doesn't count because he's not blood-related. Which seems kind of strange because, you know, he's been raised as a son. He hasn't been formally adopted because that doesn't exist yet in America. Um, And in fact, he's never actually the legal guardian for the kids. So, you know, he doesn't have a legal claim, but he is, to all intents and purposes, George Washington Park Custis's father. So right. why wouldn't people be worried about him? Because that belief in the blood direct heir is so important to people. And that's the, I have no family. That's, I don't have any blood related children. Hmm. Uh, so they were concerned that he would, st- he would, you know, remain president until he died and then it would go to his son. It would sort of repeat into this. Right. So there were people Monarch saying at the royalty. time, oh, this is a good person to be the first president because we don't have to worry about that happening. Right. Oh. Hmm. That makes sense. Gosh, that's now, fascinating. Did this, since you're sort of like moving past uh, Washington's life into the 19th century, did exploring this family teach you anything about sort of America moving past the revolutionary moment and what it became? Because you even just talked about a difference in how slavery was viewed in you know the 18th versus 19th century. Were there any other insights you gained by studying this family? Well, one thing I say about this family is that I think that the Custises show the failures of the revolutionary ideals that, you know, they are supposed to be representing George Washington's legacy by their own shaping of things. They are saying they're carrying forth George Washington's legacy. But in fact, what they end up doing is being like a lot of other Americans who never fulfill the promises of that legacy of equality, liberty (laughs) for all. Right. Mm. Those are things. In fact, slavery gets worse and it expands in this time um, while the vote expands to more white men. In many ways, opportunities for black people and women actually shut down in the 19th century. In certain ways, they get closed out of more. Um, So you actually see some of the promise, not that the founders had fulfilled this, but that they were sort of hoping would happen in future generations, I think, or some of them did that the Custises, in fact, don't live up to that. And I think the one person that I argue in the book that comes closest to that is actually the Custis's probable half-sibling, a mixed-race man named William Coston, who was probably Jackie Custis's son with an enslaved woman. There, we have pretty good evidence that he is Jackie's son. And mm-hmm. he actually fights a Black civil rights case in the court in D.C., And he's involved in a lot of charitable organizations. He's doing what he can to 
fight against or at least mitigate the bad effects of slavery. He buys the freedom of multiple people. So in some yeah. ways, I'd say it's William Coston who's doing more to sort of push that founding legacy in more progressive directions than the Custis kids are. And that's really, you know, the, the book ends, they all die soon before the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they would have been terribly upset by the Civil War, but things they were doing contributed to that war. Right. Wow. This is it. This is really interesting. I mean, I've I've done some research on the grandkids and this is just opening my eyes to so many new things. Um, is there anything that you learned that was sort of particularly shocking or just um, sort of out of left field or against what you thought you would find? Um, and not just the grandchildren, but just sort of these families in general. Well, I think there's a couple of little moments I can think of there. Because um, all of these, all of the Custises are a little strange or eccentric. <laughs> Eliza Custis is very strong-willed. And she separates from and later divorces her husband. And then I love that she's flirting with all these French guys and she loves the French. And so she says like she wants to marry a French guy. She's flirting with the French ambassador and people are warning her, like some of her friends are saying, you know, don't really do this. Apparently there were multiple women interested in him. And oh. then <laughs> she ends up getting engaged to this French con man who, you know, is clearly involved. There's a scheme he's involved in that puts a teenager visiting France from New Orleans in jail and the American ambassador has to work to get him out. And, you know, she's writing, she would, you know, follow him to the ends of the earth. She loves this guy. And he ends up going back to France supposedly to get permission for them to marry. And it does seem mm -hmm. like he's trying to do that. It's not clear to me why, he needs permission. Hmm. And he is saying this is George Washington's adopted daughter as part of his argument. Sure. And then the permission is denied. And then really the next thing we hear about him is he's died by suicide. And <sighs> so this whole story that George Washington's, one of his children would be engaged to a French con man who dies by suicide is just... Sounds Not like a something. soap opera. Right. Oh, I, I do think so. I, I didn't <laughs> expect to find something like that. Um, you have Wash Custis, uh, the George Washington Park Custis. I just refer to him as Wash because he's got such a long name. Mm -hmm. Not, I knew that he had written plays, but he also did these horrible paintings. And <laughs> I'm saying horrible really? because aesthetically, anybody who looks at these paintings would agree that they are not good art. And people at the time <laughs> knew they were not good. They made fun of them. To the point that he, he had a painting hanging in the rotunda of the Capitol and somebody, <laughs> there were bad reviews of it in the newspaper and he sent somebody to pick it up and told that person just to dump it in the Potomac River on the way home. <laughs> Which I think the person did. But these were all scenes of the American Revolution with George Washington in them. So they're history paintings. <laughs> and despite the fact that he painted for several decades, he never got better at it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> an art historian friend of mine was saying she thinks George W. Bush's paintings have actually gotten better from when he first started out soon after the presidency. And, uh -huh. you know, Hunter Biden's art sells for a lot of money, but nobody thought that Wash Custis's paintings were good. And, and he literally was raised by George Washington. Right. And, and he's painting that George didn't Washington. didn't even save him. <laughs> No, it is not. Listen, as as another man with a failed playwriting <laughs> career behind him, I feel for Wash. <laughs> Wash actually made some monies off of his plays. Oh, good. He, he did make money oh, off that his That makes plays. me happy. He, he said he was probably making more money off of that than farming at a certain point. Wow. And he was a pioneer in his plays in that he had one of the first Black Sambo characters in a play. Oh, really? He really? also had the guy who pioneered the jumping Jim Crow character play a minstrel character. So he was a racist huh. pioneer in his oh, plays, no. I would say. He also <laughs> is one of the first writers of Indian plays that become very popular during the time of Indian removal in the 1830s. Huh. So, so all winning character things. in many ways. Right. <laughs> There's a photo of this man, by the way. If you Google George Washington Park Custis, he he lived long enough to have his picture taken. Yeah. Um, 
Which he is looks baffling. exactly <laughs> exactly like the person who would write those kinds of plays. That's a, that's a, let's just say that. <laughs> like that's what the photo <laughs> says to me. He still is wearing clothes from an earlier era at the time he is photographed. And I think there's actually two different photographs of him. And there's multiple portraits that were done over the course of his life. So, and then in fact, his sister, Martha Custis Peter, there's also a photograph of her. And it's the only image we have of her because there are no portraits ever because they lived into oh. the two of them lived into the 1850s as did Nellie Custis wow. and there is a, there is a photograph of her as well which I have in the book it's a sad photograph I think Aww. she looks you know she had serious health problems she was partially paralyzed she may have had some kind of stroke towards the mm-hmm. end of her life so she looks like somebody who has been through a lot. She lost Mm. seven of her eight children died before she did. Oh my gosh. You know, in many ways she had a difficult life. Goodness. Um, There was Washi also, uh, Washi's daughter married someone pretty significant, correct? Yes. So Wash Custis's only white daughter, Mary Anna Randolph Custis, married her distant cousin, Robert E. Lee. And they had been family friends with the Lees and... In fact, Wash's wife, Molly, was Molly Lee Fitzhugh Custis. So they're they're related to one another distantly. And oh, hmm. even though they'd always known each other, and in fact, Wash and Molly were like surrogate parents to Robert E. Lee, they did not want Mary to marry him. He came from a kind of, his family had some scandal attached to it. Thomas Jefferson referred to the Lees as insects at one point. <laughs> uh, there was a pretty big scandal with his half-brother his father had died in a huge amount of debt. And, you know, Lee himself was not super financially stable and he was in the military, so he was going to have to travel. So it took some mm-hmm. convincing for Wash to approve of that marriage. <sighs> well, as listeners can see, there's, I mean, there's plenty of drama, a ton yes. of interesting history uh, tracing this family's roots, you know, George Washington on down the line. Um, and it's all available in Dr. Cassandra Good's new book, First Family, which is available pretty much wherever you can buy books, right? Or do you want to plug where you can grab it? Yes. The book is available from any of your favorite booksellers online or in person. I encourage you to go to your independent bookstore or shop at bookshop.org, which will help contribute to your local independent bookshop. Thanks so much for being with us here today. And we're super excited about your new book. So go out and get a copy and then maybe we'll see you for a longer episode sometime soon. Sounds great. Thank you for listening to the full episode of Too Complicated for History. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, please leave us a review on Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to follow us on our social platforms at 2C4H underscore podcast, or check out the link in the description. This will keep you in the loop for show updates, new episodes, and exclusive content. Too Complicated for History is a podcast from Primary Source Media, produced by Patrick Long and Lynn Price Robbins, edited and mixed by Curtis Fritsch, opening theme music by Sheena Biratella.